good morning and good evening everyone based on your time john welcome in salesforce fxr and today topic is boost your app with the platform cache and our speaker is daniel and my name is amit choudhury i am the founder of the salesforce fxr and the co-organizer of the farmington hill salesforce developer group and can, can you move to the next slide please the next one so here is the upcoming session in 2020 so if you are interested in any of those session please rsvp on this and all the rsvp link you will find from the apexhour.com slash session in 2020 so let me hand over to our speaker daniel yeah hi good morning um good evening good afternoon wherever you are um and happy new year to you and um thanks for the invitation Amit. Um, my name is Daniel Stange. I'm a technical architect uh, with DIA, the Interactiven, um, we're a Salesforce implementation partner in Germany. Um, and I'm with the company for five years. I'm uh, 20 times certified, uh, especially for system and application architects. So I'm on my CTA track currently. I am a leader of the Frankfurt user group um, in Germany. And you can find me on, on Twitter, um, follow Stango Mart um, for updates on me. And um, if you want to be in touch on the professional network, that's uh, Daniel Stango on LinkedIn. Or find my GitHub, uh, where I also have the sample code for this session. Um, the, what I'm going to, to guide you to, uh, through today is um, an overview of what the platform cache is. It's a lesser known feature. It's a bit seasoned already because it's been introduced in 2016. Uh, and I will share the key concepts, how it works, and show you how to actually do it, um, and uh, what you use the platform cache for, and uh, what are the considerations that you have to do when you use um, the platform cache. Uh, we will have time for uh, Q&A afterwards. Um, please post your questions to the chat, and um, Amit will have a, um, an eye on that and do the moderation, and I'll answer your questions um, at the end of the session. There's plenty of time. Um, so I'll be about 40, 40 minutes or so uh, in the presentation, and that that leaves us a good amount of time to um, to answer your questions in the in the end of the session. So let's begin. Um, the key takeaways that I um, that I expect you to learn from this session is actually how to boost your app performance significantly, and that is by the um, the quicker retrieval time that you have when you access data from the cache. Um, you should have an idea what kind of data you put into the cache, because not every data is the exact thing that needs to be in a cache. And you should, by the end, know the obstacles when you use the platform cache, because there are some, uh, some things to, uh, to keep in mind about a cache in general. So first, first of all, the question is, cache, yes, that's a nice technique. Every modern software application should have that, but why? Because when you consider what the um, the platform does in uh, when you uh, watch your, uh, when you open a record, it also already uses caching. And when you develop lightning comp uh, components, you have to disable the cache to see the results of your changes immediately. So why and what for is actually uh, um, should you have a cache? Um, and um, the the answer is in the access to data. Um, if you retrieve records through local, um, it, it takes some time, obviously. Uh, if you access data, uh, it takes time. Um, and if you put the data in a cache, um, it should be retrieved much faster because um, a cache is, actually, um, is memory instead of a, a database. Um, and it's a key value storage um, so that you bring a key and get the, um, the value in return. So when you do some measurements and try to find out uh, how it improves the read access to data, um, you will find that it takes about, say, 200, 250, something between 180 and 270 milliseconds to retrieve 10,000 records uh, from Sokol and put them in the map to be um, accessed with a, in a key values fashion. And if you do the same operation, exact same operation, but from the orcs cache, um, it will take only the 65 to uh, 97 milliseconds in my experiment on a CS83 sandbox. Um, um, so that's about two to three in a maximum about 5.7 times faster access to data. That's one thing that you can do with the cache. And um, if you look in a graph how that looks, 
when you retrieve items from the cache, um, you will see that after a, a short peak um, in the beginning, retrieving a single record from the cache is much faster, that's the red line, than uh, retrieve the same record from the database. I ran quite a number of operations and always retrieved, retrieved, retrieved the same th um, thing over and over again. And you see the first time it needs to call, um, bring the data, um, the record from the database, and then it's cached um, and the exit time is much faster. Um, okay, we'll say this is not bulky, right? Um, it doesn't work and um, it will be much faster if I do it in a um, in standard bulk operation. But I can assure you that if you read um, in a bulk fashion, like the web programmer uh, should do that, you'll read um, 100 values from the database between 367 milliseconds around that thing. That makes 3.6 milliseconds per item. And if you read them from the database, put them in the cache and retrieve all the records from the cache, um, the initial time for that is uh, 117 milliseconds. So it's still in this two, uh, around two to three times faster data access that you get from a cache. Um, and besides the, um, the impact that you get from reading the data from the database, it, it also helps you to um, reduce the cost of data access in terms of system limits. So if you um, call the database, um, that consumes a local call. Um, whereas when you query into the cache, um, this call is basically whitelisted um, and it costs you no SOCL calls. So if you're short on SOCL calls for operations, it's probably a good idea to put them in, the, um, in a cache. Also, um, it will reduce the memory footprint of your application and in, uh, especially um, each size, because if you do something uh, and retrieve values from the database, put them in a map and keep the map in the um, uh, allocated in the application, it will consume heap. And um, the heap uh, space is limited. There's a heap size limit. Um, so if you're short on heap size in your application, it's a good idea, it's probably an idea to put some of the things that you keep in the heap um, into a cache so that you can retrieve it from there. It's slightly slower than um, going from the uh, reading from the heap but it keeps your um, heap size limit on air base. So that's probably a consideration that you have to do. Um, and last but not least, um, there have been big news for ISVs on air tree ports because most, uh, uh, most often uh, ISV applications keep their configuration in data, uh, data objects and custom objects. And um, this could be much faster if they had platform cache at their hand. But um, platform cache used to be a costly feature um, at the time it was uh, introduced. So with Streamforce 2019, there has been an announcement that um, applications that are App Exchange certified, so that means security review path, um, they get a, um, a partition of cache um, of three megabytes allocated to their application. And qualified partners even get 200 megabytes um, for free with their, uh, for their App Exchange product. So this is really something that is an enormous uh, advantage for um, ISV partners because when they wanted to use platform cash in the past, they had to pay for it, and um, which actually made their products more expensive. So I'm, I use the platform cash from the perspective of an implementation partner. And what I did, um, the problem I had is that they, uh, we have a system that is coupled to an SAP system and we had those sales districts um, that SAP uses for record ownership. It's actually the same concept as the, um, the record owner in Salesforce, but sales district is more or less a, um, a person represented by the district and the, or the area or the territory in Salesforce terms of accounts they serve. So it's more or less, uh, it focuses on the territory and not the person itself. Um, but we needed to have this um, sales district assigned to records. And this is more or less a matrix um, of assigning an account to a sales district. Um, and they did it by the postal code. And that's the scenario that I'll show you later. Um, this thing often timed out. This thing often had bugs um, because data access was, uh, was sluggish. And that's just the problem that we had to solve. Um, 
And I choose to, um, to operate this on the, uh, the platform cache, and I'll show this in the example today. But first, um, let me introduce you to some key concepts about the cache. Um, I already um, used the word org cache. Um, there's um, a, second, uh, a second type of cache, cache that's a second cache, uh, a session cache. Um, and within that org cache, there's a petition. Um, and this is actually where this memory that I showed on the, uh, the second to last slide um, is assigned to. Um, the platform cache is something that is able to store um, keys and val uh, key value pairs for you. Um, it's pretty simple because um, there's a put method and a get method. Um, so you always get um, have a string uh, key and a value that is stored in a type of an object. So whatever it is, it can be anything. Um, which on the other hand means that you have to um, cast whatever you get from the cache to, um, to a Salesforce type um, after you retrieve it. Um, so keep that in mind. And keep that in mind that um, as you can put strings, um, um, key value pairs of strings to objects in the cache, you can put just anything in there. And um, if someone else puts the, um, uh, the, um, another type uh, under the name key, uh, same key, um, you will probably um, have um, an error when you cast the uh, particular type to that. So you'll have to, you have to really be sure uh, prepare for that case. Besides that, it's actually really easy to implement any uh, kind of cache strategy. But um, there are some considerations that you have to do. Uh, so I'd say it's fairly easy to design a good, with an emphasis on good and sustainable strategy. Make sure that um, you just don't implement any strategy, but a good one. Um, one thing to know as well is that the platform cache by default is visible for um, org white and it's mutable. So um, things that you put there can be accessed from, uh, from other users with the um, scope. And um, they can also be changed. So you can't be really sure that things are the same that you put in there. Um, you can set it to restricted, um, to restricted visibility and you can set it to immutable. And that's really something that, that helps you to keep your cache um, safe uh, and uh, secure and hidden away from uh, people who don't uh, look into that. So what is the, the type of data that you should put in a cache or that's typically cacheable data? And it's not just Salesforce specific, that's more or less uh, generic um, things uh, to know about a cache. Um, one uh, rule of thumb more or less is that you can put data in a cache that is preparable on the one hand, so you know in advance what you will need and it should be reusable. So um, that means um, you need it not just once, but probably twice, three times, whatever, uh, how often in your operation. And this operation will run over and over again and it will need the same data. So you can prepare beforehand the data that you need in the operation um, and keep it in the cache in a fast and um, uh, fast um, memory instead of reading it from the disk all the time. Um, Given that, um, this data should be more or less static. Uh, it shouldn't be changing frequently because whenever data changes, you have to refresh your cache or you build a strategy, you have to build a strategy for that. So if uh, data goes stale um, and you're not sure the data in the cache is still correct, um, there's a problem and the, um, there's an, a way to solve it, that's uh, for sure. Um, you just invalidate the cache after the data changed and rebuild the cache, but um, the more static data is, the less expensive is it to build the uh, the cache all the time. Um, the data you put in the cache should be frequently needed in operations. Um, why is it that way? I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but it should be really accessed often to keep it alive, and it should be for one uh, for one consideration or the other. It should be expensive to get or keep them in terms of system limits. So. Um, Building a cache should um, get you um, away from hitting either a SOCL limit or a SOCL row um, limit 
or a, a heap size limit or um, a CPU time limit or whatever limit you hit, um, if it can be solved by keeping the data in an in-memory um, key value storage, that's um, the way to go. So what I'd say, what is good data to cache that, for example, taxonomies, um, if you want to tax some uh, records in your uh, system, um, that's a taxonomy. Uh, it could be schedules um, that are more or less static and um, helpful for, uh, for most uh, for more, more than one use case. It could be mappings of data or of objects to each other. It could be conversion rates, and it could also be um, your app configuration, um, even though this is actually something that you could store in custom metadata types, for example. But um, the platform cache can also speed up and um, speed up your access to, custom, uh, to data that you previously stored in custom settings. It should so still be in custom settings because you need to build and rebuild your cache, right? Um, there are, in Sayatos, there are two cache types um, under the platform cache option. Um, this is uh, one thing is the org cache. Um, that means there is one cache for all the users and all the contexts, um, and it has uh, a variable time to live. Time to live is something really important here. Um, because after the time to live is over, everything in the cache will be gone. Um, the session cache, on the other hand, is scoped per user session. So this is um, the idea behind the session cache is to support, for example, users and their um, applications built in Visual Force at the time the platform cache was introduced. Um, there was uh, just Visual Force in place and Lightning components, Aura components were on the rise, but were not really there. And um, this was the, the way to provide a um, cache to users to, um, for their sessions whenever they did something in Visual Force, for example. Um, these could be accessed there. Um, it's more and more um, outdated. Uh, there are specific use cases in, for the session cache in um, Lightning components as well, but more or less everything that is relevant um, is in the org cache. Talking about the time to live, um, the minimum time to live for both types of caches is five minutes. Uh, so it's guaranteed if your data that you put in the cache fits into your cache partition and um, you're still within the minimum time to live, um, the data in the cache should be there. You can set the um, time to live, but the, um, the smallest amount is five minutes. And by default, um, each of the um, uh, org caches get a 24 hour time to live. You can increase that to 48 hours and by, for the session cache to maximum of eight hours because eight hours is the maximum length of a session that is not uh, unlimited in length. So, um, be sure that everything that you need is um, your cache refreshes um, run for a period that is smaller than time to live so that there are no um, empty caches. Uh, because after 24 hours, by default, um, the org cache will be empty again. There's another important strategy that you need to know, and this is called um, the eviction strategy, what does the system do when there's more in the cache um, than it can keep? Um, and it uses a strategy that's called LRU, least recently used um, as a eviction strategy. You can see um, the, um, there are some items in my cache here and they are um, ordered by age. So if I access number seven, it will push number one to the second position, number four to the third position, number three to the fourth position, and nothing changes um, in terms of the, um, of the items in the cache. But if I access number eight, um, it will be put in the first place of the sequence, and it would push the number two record um, under the red line. And under the red line means um, the cache is at capacity. Number two doesn't fit any longer into the cache if number eight comes. 
and it will be evicted and uh, removed from the cache. So the items in the cache will be more or less um, assessed under the um, under the time uh, when they were last assessed. And um, if you put something into the cache at the um, just now, it will push something out eventually if your cache is at capacity by that time. So um, for both of these reasons, you have to um, you have to may have your configurations um, to build and maintain your cache. Um, and there's two ways to do this. Um, one is um, more or less the explicit way. Um, and you probably know this from some applications. Um, Salesforce B2B Cloud, uh, B2B Commerce Cloud has something like that. There's um, a button rebuild, um, rebuild cache. And this is basically explicit caching. You push the button and they build the cache and it builds the cache. And behind the scenes, the application uh, also uses a scheduled Apex job that rebuilds the cache every night. So this is an explicit strategy of um, caching items. Um, the other thing that you could do is implicitly cache your data. Um, so whenever you need data, um, you build a cache and um, you check if there's a cache already. Um, if nothing is in there, um, you build the cache. And this could um, be done either, um, either eagerly. So eagerly means uh, load everything at the same time. And lazy means um, you just load data that you just need in the context. And when you need something else, you also put that in the cache. Um, and this is, um, this is something to keep in mind for the implementation in just a minute. What you also have to keep in mind is that your cached data might change. Um, it, could be, um, it could be deleted, it could be updated, um, it could be updated quite frequently, it could be updated quite uh, uh, from time to time. Um, and this requires really considerations because um, some data um, are easy to monitor, that is data that is on the platform, for example, if you um, put your product data into a cache, that's easy to monitor. You just build a trigger um, and um, react on changes in the data. But there could also be off-platform data. And um, this means you have to rebuild your off-platform data, the cache for your off-platform data, um, as well if there are changes. And you don't really know how often they change, um, and you probably don't even get the ability to listen to change events. So this is something that is uh, that should um, have uh, that is uh, should spend some considerations on. How would you, um, if you, for example, saw the results of a call out, let's say you call out for pricing information to SAP, how would you store this data and how would you react? Um, how would you know um, if the data has changed? So the answer is probably you don't know. So you have to rebuild the cache from time to time. Um, or you have to give the um, the items a time to live and evict them from the cache after that time. Or you have to build um, combinations of that. Uh, do a full rebuild, um, manage uh, check data from time to time, whatever it is, but you have to prepare for that and you have to build solutions for that. And with that, we're um, looking into the actual application um, and we're digging into the platform cache. Um, what you have to do in advance is um, get either an Enterprise Edition Zenbox, because there's a 10 megabyte capacity already assigned. Um, if you don't have an Enterprise Zenbox, you can request a trial capacity for your developer org or your scratch org. You just navigate to the um, platform cache navigation item. Um, and for scratch orgs, you can use the um, features parameter platform cache to just enable that. If you want to learn how to do this, there's a trailhead um, module, Platform Cache Basics, and I have prepared a bit.ly for you so that you can just uh, use the shortened link to go straight to the trailhead um, module for Platform Cache. And after um, that, you'll just um, create a partition. I'll show, um, show you in a minute how to do this. and. Um, Call this um, partition by the name and put your um, first item in there. 
And if you call the get method, you will get the, um, the stored value in return. That's pretty easy. And um, I'll just quickly jump to, um, to the org to show it how it really um, works in real life. So first of all, I got to move the controls for the webinar side. First of all, um, how do you activate the platform cache and how do you create a petition? Let's go to the setup menu. If you start typing platform cache, You'll have the um, you have the, contr um, the controls for platform cache here. Um, at the top of the page, um, there's um, there's the button. Now it shows um, trial request pending in green. So when you hit the button, you get the trial request and get 10 megabytes assigned. Um, and at the bottom of the page, you see the actual petitions that you have in the cache and how the cache um, volume uh, is currently used and um, a breakdown of the items in there. For a new petition, you can just click the new button and you know, give it a name, um, give the, um, assign some storage to that um, and decide if this is the default petition. Default petition is more or less the, um, the option to show, um, uh, to have this cache respond immediately after something, uh, uh, if you don't um, act, uh, mention a um, specific petition in your call to the cache me uh, methods, uh, it will always hit the default petition. So the thing that I prepared um, for you is um, the a simplified version of the um, scenario that I had with the SAP sales district. Um, you can see in the, uh, the details that uh, for every account there's a sales district assigned and I have two or three random users in the system that are owners of the sales district. So whenever I create a new account, say, um, This is the first Apex Hours account, which uh, is somewhere in a in a town in uh, somewhere here in Germany. Let's say in the Münster area. Um, we give it a postal code of 25,000 and let it work. Um, we did get a sales district, the E25, and if we check the um, developer console, let's do this again. We see that the, um, the sales district was assigned um, in 30 milliseconds and it didn't query the database because I had just hit the same, um, same sales district before, um, just a minute before. So I moved the, for demonstration purposes, I uh, moved this to a um, different postal code to get a new sales district. You see the ownership has changed and the DE24 sales district is assigned. And it's the first time I used um, the E24 sales district. Um, if you look to the um, if you look to the um, to the log that I created here, um, 
we could have a uh, cache miss and we queried the database for the information and you see it took 24 milliseconds as compared to 30 milliseconds and it consumed the SOCL row um, to uh, SOCL query to populate the cache. Keep that in mind, 24 milliseconds and a SOCL query consumed while I create the, um, the second APEX hours account, which is also located um, in the nice, in the nice city of uh, Münster. Germany, and we give it the billing postal code 24001, doesn't matter. And I've chosen an invalid option, so, so. Any? There's our account. Um, the sales district again has um, been assigned successfully. And let's check the log if the database has been touched. The database has not been touched and it um, ran in 15 milliseconds instead of 24. So this is the impact of the, um, the platform cache. I'll show you how I, um, how I built this in just a second. Um, but to, to give you an idea how it, uh, what the improvement is. Um, you can um, you can relate to the um, the demo. Um, if you want to build this on your own, um, there is a repo on GitHub um, where I have uh, the instructions and the the sample code that I used here, um, and I'll um, guide you through what happens there. So the first thing you have to do when you want to access the cache is um, you check for the key. Is it there? Is it not there? Um, if it is there, um, you retrieve the value and re you return the value. If the value is not there, um, that's a cache miss. And um, a cache miss would mean um, an error. Uh, and not to, uh, so that you don't have an error, you load the data from source, um, store it in the cache again, and then return the value. That's the path we are taking in the application. Um, there is a an interface that Salesforce provides, and that's the cache builder. And the cache builder interface actually requires you to only um, tell you where the, uh, how to find the data in the system, um, and it will return the value. Um, that's pretty, pretty easy, and it's, um, that's something really cool. Um, so for most of the, uh, the things that we built, um, I just use the cache builder interface, because it's pretty easy, and you only have to write a SQL query. Um, which guide me to two um, distinct um, implementation types that you could um, that you could choose. Um, one is the um, what we call a read through in a, um, implementation, where the data sits in that object, and if you express it, um, and the only um, requirement that you have is access it through a SQL query. Um, it's pretty easy, you have to write really little code, um, um, but it only works for as objects that are in Salesforce and everything that can be accessed in local queries. If you can't do that, you have to go for a custom implementation. So you have to create the path um, um, that you go in terms of finding the value, um, returning the value, handling the mismith gracefully. Um, that's basically the, um, for off-platform data, or if you want to store more than one record in a cache item. And if that's, uh, if that's cross object data that, you, that needs more than one SQL query to find, um, that's the stuff you uh, have to go custom for. Um, So this is um, the thing that you showed, uh, that you just saw. Um, I created a um, sample sales district, I entered a postal code and assigned an owner. And that's basically what happened. Um, so this is, um, this is the thing that I um, did for a complete custom implementation. I have um, made the, my own cache manager and I, 
created a, um, a method that populates the sales district so that I can call it whenever I um, hit a miss. And I made it schedulable as well so that I can call the um, populate sales district method um, uh, every 24 hours or so. And at the end of the um, of the loop, you can see that um, I have the cache.org.put and then the name of the cache um, and the sales district record. So this is the way how it had to be done in the first two years. Um, you can, uh, here's my get district method that puts the data, that calls the, the cache, tries to find the, um, the data, and if not, um, falls back to the database and queries for the record. Um, this is basically the, um, the standard implementation uh, for the past two years, um, which was replaced by the read-through cache. Um, wrapping it up, what the custom implementation is, you need to find a way to populate your cache, and you need to uh, find a way to manage changes in the cache data. That's what you call invalidation of the cache. Um, um, and what I did, did to invalidate my sales district cache is whenever the sales district change on disk, um, a trigger on the sales district will just write the um, changed sales district values to the cache. So that's my invalidation method. Um, pretty pretty simple, um, but I used the triggers on the sales district object to invalidate the cache for this object. Um, and then I designed a request to the cache that handles uh, cache misses gracefully. Uh, loads the data, puts them back in the cache, and returns. Um, the read-through cache is much simpler because it uh, just calls the cache builder method. Um, the cache builder um, interface um, just has a do load method, and the do load method does nothing else but um, returning um, the result of the SQL query. So whenever I call um, the, um, the get method for cache has changed a bit. You can see um, down there, um, it's cache.org.get, uh, and it gives the, not the name of a cache partition, but the name of a cl Apex class. Um, and at the second parameter is the sales district key, again, uh, the key um, to search for in the cache. Um, here's the implementation for the method. Um, here, um, I told you there's the do load method, and it should return um, the sales district that is queried by the, uh, from the database, um, filtered by the sales district key, um, that is the second parameter in the call, um, and it's passed through to the do load method. Um, that's more or less everything that you need to do to uh, implement a read through cache. Wrapping it up, um, the first thing um, that's really it's, it's really easy and really really cool to get the um, a cache that's uh, at least twice as fast as the database running uh, at the beginning. But there is a catch, and the catch is that what you have there is a cache in a memory construct that uh, lives only 24 to 48 hours. And this is not a data a database, so don't reuse it to replace your database. Um, and remember that it's really short-lived, and if you don't say it uh, differently, it's visible to everyone and it's mutable for everyone. So data in the cache can change. Um, make sure that you understood that there's um, the time to live and the least recently unit um, uh, concept to the cache, so if the use. The things that you store in the cache are larger than the partition. The least recently used items fall out of the cache, and that's why you should expect the cache um, to fail you and catch um, any misses. Um, and really, failing means also bad data or invalid data, so you need to build your um, invalidation strategy. The strategies that, are, that you could you do are more or less, if the cache is the way, um, to make sure that the cache doesn't go away, you can schedule um, a cache rebuild at an interval that is shorter than your time to live. Um, if cached items will be pushed out, um, you can use the cache builder interface, or you can use a sample ca uh, like your cache manager like I did uh, in my custom code to um, push, put the beta data back in. 
um, if the data goes stale, you can, um, and it's your on-platform data, you can rebuild from triggers uh, to prevent stale data in the cache from, uh, uh, from other systems. You can re um, cache also the, the call out results. Um, and there's another limit that I didn't mention, um, that items in this cache cannot be larger than 100 kilobytes. So if you have to put anything uh, in that's larger than 100 kilobytes, you have to build, uh, find, and find how to wrap those. And one thing to reduce memory footprint is write your own uh, wrapper classes that only store the data you really, really need. Um, an example here is um, a little cache um, that I built for um, um, products. Um, which maps the product code to the um, to the product ID um, and the lead time that the product has. Um, if I query the fields as, as object, um, the right hand side, um, there's an overhead in that. Um, so to reduce the overhead, I just use um, used a APEC defined type cache product that you see on the right, left side. It only stores name, product code, and lead time. It looks as if it is the same, but look at the difference. No items, cached items may exceed 100 kilobytes. How many of these objects can I store? The answer is I can put around 9,000 S object records with the same fields queried in this as compared to 12,500 um, Apex defined objects of the same, with the same fields and the same types. Um, so it really matters um, if you have to, if you're short on, on the 100 kilobytes, it matters if you put S objects there or APEX defined types because S objects always have no overhead um, from the inherited method, etc. So, just to remind you, you have to heard this quite a number of times now. Don't use the cache as a database. Um, don't use it as a temporary storage for transactional data as well. It's it might be tempting to build something that is between member variables uh, to cross the barriers of static variables and um, object variables. Really, don't use it for transactional data. Um, no items larger than 100 kilobytes, and it's not persisted. And you shouldn't be the, um, you shouldn't rely on them uh, data being there. Um, the chain uh, data can change if you don't flag it as immutable. One thing, a word about best practices. Um, one best, best practice and um, recommendation is um, to cache lists or maps rather than single objects. Um, the trade-off is um, fewer and larger operations perform better than uh, smaller and atomic operations for each, each and every item. Uh, it takes the time to hit the cache and um, get the uh, results back. So if you need um, 100 items, bring a list of 100 items uh, in one call instead of 100 calls on, on one item. Um, on the other hand side, um, a list in the map can easily go over the 100 kilobytes. So um, there's the trade-off. Uh, operations perform better if you put more um, objects um, or more items in one uh, cached item, and um, the cached items may not exceed 100 kilobytes, so there's a trade-off to that. Um, if you store um, if you store as objects, um, you can use wrapper classes to reduce the overhead, um, and always use the qualified name of your cached partition, even though if you ha uh, even when you have just one, because if someone changes the flex of um, the default uh, of which partition is the default cache, you will not uh, hit your cache at all if you don't use the fully qualified names. And um, really consider immutable and visibility as, um, as parameters to your cache. If you want to learn more, um, there's the documentation, there's um, a tra even a trail for, um, for the, um, the platform cache. Um, you can find my sample code uh, at my GitHub account, and there are some excellent uh, blog posts, uh, for example, from Keir Bowden, who um, wrote the first article, Josh Kaplan wrote the official Salesforce article on the Salesforce blog, and a certain Amit Chowdhury 
uh, wrote something about the platform cache. So um, make sure you know and read these articles because uh, they are, give you the best introduction to the platform cache. And with that, um, keep in mind that you can reach out uh, to, you can reach me at uh, Twitter, at Stango um, post me an email, um, interact with my GitHub account, download that stuff, um, and I'm open for your questions. And let's see what's going on in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Stay. Uh and yeah, let me read if we have any question on the chat window. Mm -hmm. so one question. I see that Luke has, has a question. Go ahead, please. <laughs> I, um, I can see that the um, Luke has the question, uh, is platform cache copied to sandboxes? And um, the content of the cache, as far as I know, is not copied, but the, the partitions are um, are copied to sandboxes if you create the um, the sandbox fresh. That's as far as I have it in mind. That's the the, the behavior um, in in caches. Guys, if you have any other question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question directly. Mm -hmm. Hello, hi. I have David. a. Um, Sorry. So I have one question. So my question is, if we try to use the platform cache for the enterprise applications, do we follow any framework? Because you already shared one framework and a GitHub link to debug and to record the logs, how, how we are improving on that performance and are we hitting or missing and rebuild the cache whenever it is required or anything else uh, we must follow for the enterprise applications. Um, could you could you please repeat the question? Uh, what the exact question? Um, I, did, I did, didn't really follow what. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, Daniel, my question is: uh, What are the best, best uh, practices of the framework we should follow if we are trying to introduce the platform cache, uh, complete uh, module of platform cache in the enterprise application? Now? Mm. The, um, the, um, the the ideal uh, ideal way to um, the ideal way to uh, to implement the cache is actually at first find out which data in, uh, you need in your operation um, frequently and uh, permanently. So the um, the the thing that we um, we had in this example with the SAP thing was like everything had to be um, had to get the um, um, had to always to had to be always assigned to the correct sales district and the, um, yeah, they, and the correct um, the can order from that and the um, so the the thing that we uh, did is like this consumes a lot of time and um, system limits in the uh, in, during the application during the execution context, and each and every trigger hits on that. So we need to find something, uh, and we know the um, the key is a, is a string, so we know that. And um, we, this is a, a good foundation to to look for um, for the correct way to get this data into the operation without consuming all the system limits. If you do that, um, uh, if you start with the Salesforce uh, the trader trail. Um, you learn how to actually do that, but you don't need to get the um, an idea about the the things to put into that cache. Um, so it's uh, it's always easier to come from uh, to scan your code for the exact things that you need often uh, and that take uh, eat up your uh, your limits, and then um, build from um, design from there. Uh, got it, Daniel. Any suggestion on the uh, key value uh, keys we should maintain? In applications, uh, like uh, we generally use a class name and the method names and the something else than the business logic. So, any any suggestion on that? Mm. How the key name should be ideally? Mm. The um, if you use the the cache builder interface, you have no choice. Um, then the um, then the key will be uh, always be the um, 
uh, will be created automatically um, by um, what I would um, the, the cache itself is um, has a fully qualified name and the key um, so the keys can be by any string um, so you have some some space to um, to uh, just express whatever you need so I'd, I'd go for patterns like uh, maybe uh, if your app is broken down in, in really in, in modules, you can use um, a kind of pseudo namespace um, for the keys. Um, but the the keys should be uh, should relate to something on the record that is more or less um, predictable. So the if you think what what a good what a good key might be, might um, then it's any field on the record that relates um, that is unique or um, in your organization. I use the external ID for the sales district, for example, which is uh, has to be unique. Um, otherwise, you hit something like uh, um, the uh, if the E15 or the E25 is uh, is ambiguous, um, it's it doesn't help you. Um, it won't re will return the wrong data. So um, it should either be an ID field or an um, or a um, external ID field or something like this. Anything that's unique or something that you can um, that you can create as a unique key. For example, a, an MD5 hash over something that contains this and that. Um, probably in that direction. I'm sure that it's more or less an incomplete answer, but you, um, the, the, it always depends on how do you want to, uh, what kind of data is in your cache, and um, is there a way to make sure that whenever you call it, um, the, the key for that is unique, in, uh, unique enough that you can rebuild uh, either uh, both rebuild it from the source and get the exact same key or um, and also when you call for that key you get exactly what you wanted to have so um, the namespace and the fully qualified names make sure that it is your cache that you hit um, and then it's up to you to um, design keys that are um, unique enough and um, if you but it depends on the data that you um, that you actually handle with the cache if you don't, um, I don't have anything. Uh, um, it don't give me an, uh, an advantage if I make my key very complex. And the only thing that I get from the raw data is the E25. So it has to be the E25. That's the thing I want to match data on. Um, that's uh, what's important. Uh, so when you design it, um, it depends on your use case that you have. Um, the chat window has a, um, a question from Jayesh. Um, could you explain about session in cache? Um, I think that relates to the, um, the session cache. Um, the, um, the, session, um, the session in cache is um, the same as um, the se your session um, as a user in um, in Salesforce. So when you, whenever you log in, um, you start a session, and the session expires. Um, and the, um, the session cache type um, is at always attached to um, to the user session. So if you um, if you create a session cache, um, the um, there will be a session cache established um, when the user logs in, and it will live as long as the user session um, lives. And that means before you're locked out, um, unless you state a shorter time to live. So it's always it will always live as long as the user session, a maximum of eight hours, a minimum of five minutes. Um, so it's always as long as the session of the user or um, the the time to live that you gave. If it is shorter than the session, when the user logs out, the session cache will die as well. Uh, so it's more or less um, if you um, if you as a user want to, uh, if you want to put something in a um, in a cache that the user uses over and over again, 
um, with every action that they, um, they make, you query it, um, query it, put it in the cache, and speed up the op uh, same operation again um, each time the user does it. Um, but it doesn't live um, outside of the session of the user. Um, there is a question that is, what happens when the cache content is larger than 300 megabytes? Um, then the um, LRU um, concept uh, hits you. Um, the thing I tried to, um, to explain, let's see if I can get to that slide. The little mule, the crypto check. There it is. Oops, that was fast. That was fast. <laughs> um, no. Let's do it this way. Um, this is the, uh, what happens when the um, the cache is over when you go over the 300 megabytes capacity. Um, what happens is that the least recently used items will just go under the red line and will fall out of the cache. That's basically um, that's basically what states what does when the cache is uh, is overloaded. Um, Luke uh, Luke's question is: Is there a way to populate it through an API? Um, as far as I know, it is not exposed to any of the APIs. Um, but it's um, what what you could do is um, have a custom REST interface that allow um, that writes the things that you throw in uh, throw via your custom REST endpoint straight to the um, the org cache. So you could probably um, annotate your um, your cache manager um, cache manager interface for your cache builder class. Let me see where I have this. Cache builder. Um, so you could uh, annotate the um, populate uh, populate uh, populate cache class um, with um, a rest in a, um, um, a custom rest endpoint and then throw your data um, through a custom rest endpoint to that. That would be the only solution that comes to my mind uh, to do it through an API. Mm. 300 megabytes again, 300 megabytes per subscriber org, and this free of cost. Um, for, for ISV partners, you can, um, if your app is uh, a certified app exchange um, app, um, you will get 300 megabytes per subscriber org um, uh, assigned to the subscriber org with your product, yeah. And um, as far as I know, that's free of cost. Um, if you are on Enterprise Edition, as a customer in your local namespace, you get 10 megabytes um, for your um, for you to use. And that's also free of cost with Enterprise Orgs. Um, it also goes for Enterprise Edition sandboxes. Um, and um, also not only is enterprise edition, but also unlimited and uh, performance edition. Um, if I'm an app exchange developer, do I need to check additional checks in code for platform cache enabled in customers org? Um, no, the, um, you don't have to do additional checks because the um, the platform cache is something that you can't just enable or disable. It's there. Oh wait, oh wait. That's an interesting thing. If you if you use the platform cache in your ISV product, um, you should. I don't know how it is. If you um, you can be sure that the platform cache is enabled for enterprise edition and upwards. Um, the interesting thing is, if you build something for professional edition, I have no idea if uh, you can bring your platform cache, um, but the uh, subscriber doesn't have the platform cache available at his hands because they don't have APEX, they don't have platform cache, etc. 
um, I'm not sure if your package is not uh, will not be compatible with the subscriber at all, or if you just bring in your platform cache and um, can uh, install it. I'm really not sure about this. Um, probably reach out to your um, to your account manager and our partner account manager to learn more about this. I'm, I really have no idea how to do this in, uh, in packages in this detail. So, um, but what you should do is um, uh, you also bring your cache petition, so you can expect it to be there. Um, but um, to make sure that um, that your um, that your cache petition is there, you should. Um, even though it is packaged with your product, um, you can do your checks around that, but um, it's not needed as far as I know. Um, instead of, you see the, um, the put method just here. Um, the local um, is replaced by your package's namespace, and that, uh, from there it's uh, just the way you do it in, in packages all the time. So um, you can verify that you can access this ca uh, cache, but I'm, um, as long as it's, it's packaged with your application, it should be there. So that's um, all for the questions that were on the chat. If, there, if you have any questions left, unmute yourself and uh, shoot your questions. We have some time left for sure. Okay, so look like we are done with the question and answer. I'm not able to see any new question. So thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for a great session on the weekend. And thank you everyone for the joining us. Have a great holiday and weekend. I'll just get you through the line. Ooh, there it is. That's what you needed. Yeah, and we will definitely post the recording on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned and wait for the recording. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good year.